everyone else that we have here. So I am very proud and honored to be a small part of this major, major literacy support that we have with the Patent Symposium. Today's conversation will be about language structures and verbal reasoning. And it's a topic that I really am passionate about because I find sometimes within programming and instruction that they are the missing links. And if we want our children to read closely, we wanna be sure that we are attending to all aspects of what will make children successful. So thanks for being on this journey with me. I wanna start by asking you if you think this is a good example of close reading. Carl, a very busy spider. Okay, early one morning, the wind blew a spider across the field. A thin silky thread trailed from her body and the spider landed on a fence post near the pond. Wait, wait, and it began to spin a web with her silky thread. What's that? Nay, nay, said the horse, want to go for a ride? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning her web. What's that? Moo, 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 moo said the cow, want to eat some grass? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning her web. What's that? Ba 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 bleated the sheep, want to run in the meadow? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning the web. What's that? Ma ma said the goat, want to jump on the rocks? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning the web. What's the pig say? <laughs> oink oink grunted the pig, want to roll in the mud? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning her web. What's the dog say? <laughs> woof woof barked the dog, want to chase a cat? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning her web. Meow, meow, cried the cat. Want to take a nap? The spider didn't answer. She was very busy spinning her web. What's that one? Yeah, yeah. Quack, quack, called the duck. Want to go for a swim? The spider didn't answer. She had now finished her web. What's that one say? <laughs> What's it say? Cock the doo doo from the rooster. Want to catch a rusty fly? And the spider caught the fly in her web just like that. What's the owl say? Oh, who, who asked the owl who built this beautiful web? The spider didn't answer. She had fallen asleep. It had been a very, very busy day. <laughs> the end. <laughs> So that's my Ava, who now is four years old, but at a very ripe age, of course, she was listening to lots of read alouds. Do we really think that being exposed to that text, did Ava really understand what it was that Michaela, my Michaela was, was reading to her? Likely not, although there were many things she was picking up, and we'll think about that in just a heartbeat. So let's keep that in mind, that we can listen to or hear and read ourselves close reading information, and maybe not truly understand what it is. And we have to work on her reproduction of a rooster, don't we? So as we think about this morning, our time together, I'll, we'll focus on the importance of literacy knowledge and verbal reasoning for close reading. And not every, re every text needs to be read closely, by the way. We'll predict what makes a text difficult, especially in light of those two strands. And we'll talk about experiences and interactions and approaches that can support both literacy knowledge and verbal reasoning. Of course, information that we provide for our teachers and for ourselves will make us smarter than our programs because programs don't teach children, right? We do, educators do. So with that in mind, there's a little simulation I would like us to experience all the way through. This is a thread that I'll be bringing all the way through. I would like you to read this passage, which by the way, is set to be about 80% accurate when you read this. Read it silently, read it just once, and then I'll let you know what to do next. Anyone want to leave yet or go to the nurse? <laughs> Anybody give up? <laughs> if you chat, I can see the chat. So if you can, um, if anybody has those feelings, you just let me know. I don't blame you. This is not easy. And my guess is, well, maybe you're not even quite to the end. However, it's pretty frustrating to read this. I was kind of shocked. Yep, I see a lot of people going, yikes, or oh my goodness, very frustrating. And Lynn, you have no idea what's going on? Well, I don't blame you. One of the big ideas today is that 
accuracy will always be important, especially for comprehension. You can't understand what you can't read. And when I was a special educator, I often wrote some of my goals at 80% accuracy levels, which now when I think about it, hmm, the student wouldn't be able to understand this, would they? So I'll unlock the code, just like we have an alphabetic system and word recognition is extremely important. Yeah, oh, and I'm sorry to know that that is so painful for some of us to, to do this, that's right. Yep, and some of you are quitting. So to think about this, I'll give you the key, unlock the code, just like we do with our students. Here you go. If you saw a word that looked a little jumbled and 20% of them were, just consider the code that I created. When you have a letter, think about what letter either precedes it or comes right after it in the alphabet. That's the letter I was intending. So if you see an A in that one of those jumbled words, I was representing either a Z or a B. If you see a B, either an A or a C, okay? Um, so all of those um, are important. And, and thank you for some of you. Um, oh, thank you, okay. Yep, in chat, people are letting me know. Yes, I can see the chat responses and not all of you can see each other. So I will be a little more explicit in letting you know what I'm seeing here. But some of you are giving up and some of you are saying that this is extremely, extremely difficult. So here's the unlocking the code right in here. When you, again, when you see that, those letters, think about what comes before or what comes after this. Piece of cake, right? No problem? Let's give that a try. Okay, here comes the passage. Still with our 20% difficulty. Now go ahead and read it. You know the code, right? Hmm. Do you think the upcoming controversial it could be an S or a U, an E or a G, an A or a C, S or a U? Oh my goodness. All right, some of you are telling me that, well, you could decode this now, but it's going to take us much longer than our, our hour and 15 minutes that we have together. <laughs> no, you don't want to spend that whole time doing this. Whew. If you didn't, yeah, yikes is right. Many people are writing yikes in here. If you didn't give up before, certainly it must feel like you'd want to give up now. And my guess is we still don't really have a good idea about what any of this means, right? Yeah, that's right. Yep. So one person got one word here and then you just gave up. And that's in the first line. Mm -hmm. Jury. There's a jury. The word jury is in there. So for those of you who figured that out, bravo but there's so much more to go. So it is very frustrating. And I see some of you saying that this is the whole point. So I'll tell you what, we're considering close reading. Let's consider that students have really strong word recognition. Here are the words that were omitted. What is the author talking about here? Okay. And some of you are telling me you're only trying the short words. I think you can decode these now. Go ahead and read that silently for just a moment. Okay, and some of you are saying this is frustrating, but you want to keep at it, keep at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> some of you are changing the ideas about what you think the passage is, is about. If you want, take a moment and chat, just chat to me. I'll see these and I'll share some of these. What are some of the ideas? What do you think this passage is about? Mm, one of you is saying, even after reading this, you're still not sure what this is about. Someone is telling me that this is suggesting that this is about a picnic um, or a party. And we're bringing some coffee. People are having to get dressed up because they're ironing their clothing. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Some kind of a competition maybe that they're having a celebration about. Ah, okay. We're not sure still. So even though we have good word recognition, we're not so sure about what this is about. Some of you are completely stumped and no wonder, I would be too if I were you. 
So keep this in your mind. We're going to come back, circle back around to this passage here and unlock the key. And there are a few components of language we need to dissect before we are ready to do that. Thank you for thinking about this. Thank you for entertaining this passage. Now let's go to what we know to be important strands of what we need to understand passages. Here is the reading rope, Hollis Scarborough's reading rope. As a quick write, sort of a brain dump if you would, please take a moment with a pen or pencil and a scrap piece of paper, write down, do you remember what the strands are if you know Hollis Scarborough's rope model for both language comprehension and word recognition? What are those strands in this visual metaphor for how we understand what we read? Oh, some of us are talking about this is about golf. Okay. And that it's very important golf. Okay. And there's a barbecue competition. Okay. And some of you don't even care what it's about <laughs> because you have no connection. That's not rude at all. I love that you're being honest. Our students would be like that. Oh, some people think it's about a triathlon. So as you're doing your quick right, and dumping as much as you can remember about Hollis Scarborough's rope model, you might remember, if you know this, this um, metaphor here, that word recognition is a combination of phonological awareness, the ability to be able to work between sound and symbol in our brains, to decode and to spell, because spelling supports our reading, and to recognize words automatically as if by sight. That was the alphabetic system that I was really messing with with about 20% of the passage, wasn't it? In addition to that, of course, language comprehension, the ability to be able to understand what it is that you hear or read consists of background knowledge. Some of you were telling me in the chat, you needed background knowledge in order to better understand that passage. I'll be filtering that in in a minute. Vocabulary, a few of you were saying there were some words in there that you were unclear of what they really meant. Language structures, we're going to really take that one apart, the syntax. Verbal reasoning, our bill, oh, and many of you, by the way, are now convinced this is about golf. So it's great, keep that in mind. Verbal reasoning, our ability to understand how, how sentences connect with each other, how to predict, how to infer, how to keep our thinking moving forward and know what to do when we get stuck, if you will, the metacognitive part of reading and literacy knowledge, how our passages are organized. So we are going to focus on the top part. We're gonna focus on two in particular today. And in addition to that, we need to consider one more thing before we start this content. It is these letters, so this is an acronym here, hmm, these letters, they stand for something. So first, what do you think these letters represent? If you have an idea, please go ahead and chat them. I'll share what you're chatting as you put this in there. And I still love, I think most people consider this is golf for a barbecue competition and tournament. Okay. So see, yeah, this is about how these letters could be in different combination, combinations. And now some of you are getting this exactly. That's right, Angie and Jill and Jennifer. So we think about the words L stands for listening, R stands for reading, S for speaking, and W for writing. If I were to put these in order, just to keep these in our mind as we walk through our content today, how would you order these? What order would you put them in from easier to more difficult? What number one through eight would be your preferred order? Just thinking about that. I see someone putting in a five, five. It looks like you're all agreeing on five so far. And I would agree with that as well. We listen, that's a receptive process with no print involved. We speak, that's an expressive. It makes it a little more difficult. Again, no print. The orthographic processor sort of divorced out from that. Then we bring orthography in the letter and letter patterns when we read another receptive task. And when we write, that's the most difficult linguistic skill of all. That is our expressive task out of our hand. And we'll think about those in that order and, and specifically here. So when we think about this and we're going to think about the strands of the rote model, our, we have our background knowledge and vocabulary being very important. We really do have to deal with vocabulary. Some of you are mentioning there's a word in there is kind of bothering you. If you were to teach this passage to a student, 
um, to student group. What word or words would you choose to pre-teach here? Words that would be important to this content that would help give you a little idea of what this is about. If you have an idea of a word or two that you would consider what we call a tier two word. Ah, some of you, Laura, Aaron, you're putting in the word that starts with a K in that very first line. And iron, mm -hmm. yep, iron as well, because what's up with that iron? That's kind of interesting too. Okay, all right, okay. So we might think of words that students don't know. Thank you for sharing some of yours. Like, we might think of the word bantered. That's a word that students don't typically hear, but is in this passage and, and it gives you a little feel for how students um, want to come across and understand that text. Briefed. These aren't briefs like briefs that you wear, right? That's a verb in this in this case, in the past tense. Grueling, that's a word we might not have heard, certainly here. Yep, and somebody is also saying in the chat here, oh my goodness, I hope occurring is not that a branding, like really a branding iron, like what's going on with that? So we're still wondering. Overshadowed, not a typical word. And the last word that, you, <laughs> that I picked, of course, is the word that many of you chose. In addition to iron, is this word that starts with a K. Is this what your brain thought of when you saw that word, Keurig? I wonder, because we're thinking about, some of you are saying a barbecue and a cook-off. There were other words that kind of talked about that. This K word was sort of like Keurig, right? Yeah, yep, yep. Elise is saying, yeah, it was just about coffee. Do you notice the orthographic form of the word that's in the passage? It's slightly different, isn't it? With that one letter, the N, it changes the whole meaning of that word. Yeah, that's right. So, yep, so if you read it, read it as Keurig first, some of you are reading it as Keurig, you probably were thinking and went to the schema around coffee, right? Yeah, so if this word makes no sense in the context, let's take a look at what this word really means. So the word with the N is Curring. Oops, excuse me. I went two clicks ahead here. Let me just get back there. That's a curring. Say that word with me. Curring. How would you ever know what that word is? It's a very specialized word. It's an experience or um, an annual meeting for horse inspections. So they evaluate the breedings of specifically Dutch warm bloods. bloods. They're called a curring. Um, and judges come over from Holland because that's where Dutch warm bloods are originate and they come over and actually fly all throughout the country and they inspect horses for things like soundness and ability to do certain movements in here. So that's occurring. Hmm. I bet that one word, that one vocabulary word, when we think of our vocabulary influence, really now changes the way in which you looked at that pattern. Can't closely read if you don't know the meanings of any of those words. Yeah, doesn't it change everything? Some of you are saying that in the chat, it sure does. Keep that in mind. Let's dig a little deeper into language structures. We'll do that one first. I'll take my strand here and I will reorganize behind me just to keep this in mind. Listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Everything we talk about in all the language structures, I wanna think through this lens. We want first to watch our children in words and have them listen, speak back to us. Of course, they want to read. We want them to read individually and deeply. And then of course, write about what they read. That all improves your comprehension. So we'll start with syntax. Syntax, syn means with, like synergy. I think of that word. And tassian means to arrange. So we're thinking about how we arrange words in a sentence in focusing on the role that those words take, not memorizing whether something's a noun, a verb, an adjective, or an adverb, but understanding the role that those words take within the sentence. So when we think about this, we wanna predict what will make sentences difficult for our children. Here are three. The number of propositions or idea units, right, um, here. So that inf information, how many ideas are packed within one sentence? really is a huge memory load for children in their brains. Secondly, the distance between subject, verb, and object. Our environments, because we hear the English language, our brains are washed with, as we listen to people speak, the order of subject, verb, and object. Not all languages are like that. 
But those are critical elements of our sentence, our sentences here. That's what we expect. So that's what we're waiting for. And the order, right? Subject, verb, and object. What if it's not in that order? That's very confusing as well. So I'm going to put that a little more simply. The number of ideas, the distance between those major parts of a sentence, subject, verb, um, and or object, and the order of those. So we can take a look at it this way. Some sentences are complex. We can predict that children will have difficulty with them because they have multiple subjects within them. We call that a compound subject. So sub sub subject could be talking about two, three, or even more than three things, the who or the what's in a sentence. We could also have a sentence that has more or one action. So a subject that has in multiple actions, we call that a compound predicate. Or sentences could be even more difficult by having compound subjects and compound predicates, right? So when we look at subjects within a passage, even beyond the word curring, right? We can look at the sentence types and notice that some of those are going to be heavier loads and difficult for our students. We're gonna talk about lifting those up and working with them. We also can have distance between those major pieces. So we can have the subject and then you have to wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, boom then there's the verb, the action here. Or it may be that the author puts lots of information first, wah, 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 and then the subject, the main subject of the sentence is sort of in the middle or towards sometimes even the end of the sentence. It makes it that much more difficult to understand. The order being changed, well, here we are with object, verb, subject, really? Hmm. We'll take a look at that in just a moment. So what can you do when you predict that students are going to be confused by subjects? Well, when we have a compound subject, it could look something like this. I love this sentence. For those of you who study letters with me and for, with our letters family, phonology, orthography, morphology, semantics, and syntax are really the core, the cornerstone of how we code words in our brain. Well, all of those are important layers of language to represent during our instruction. But that's a lot to say. Those are multiple subjects. We could also take a look at an example where we have one subject, Patton's Literacy Symposium. Here, it does three different things. Let's see, provides research findings, supports collaborative learning, and leads to improved results for students reading scores. That's a mouthful, and it's a lot for students to understand. So what do we do when we see sentences like this? Well, we can deconstruct those. How might you deconstruct that second sentence here? Just take a moment with a pen or pencil and see if you can deconstruct that sentence, that second one. What would that sound like? Because sentence imitation is extremely helpful. I wonder how many sentences you're making. You can, if you want, share them in the chat. I'm also noticing as we're looking, I'm looking at the chat, people are talking about, hmm, that one word did change everything. Okay. So Laurel's saying there's one sentence we could start it with. That's right, Patton provides research. Okay. That's right. That's one idea unit or even Patton's Literacy Symposium provides research findings. We might say Patton's Literacy Symposium provides research findings from esteemed, esteemed authors, period. Oh. Second idea, that's where we're talking about the collaborative learning, right? We could have a whole sentence about collaborative learning. Additionally, this experience supports collaborative learning, period. Right, so we take that out, great, yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so some of you, yep, three simpler sentences, articulating those ideas. So it's not that it's bad, it's, it's bad practice to have sentences that are lengthy with compound subjects or compound predicates. It is that we want our students to really be aware of the cognitive load, understand the pieces here. And this is a really nice sentence deconstruction activity when you have students that might be struggling with this type of, of sentence. So thank you for some of your ideas as you're talking um, in here in the chat. Let's consider this. Sometimes we have a lot of language, blah, 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 and then finally we get to the subject. Due to the need of all students to read and write at high levels, comma, the Patent Literacy Symposium organizes stellar professional development opportunities for educators. 
well, where's the main subject here? It doesn't come at the beginning, does it? Some of our students who are confused by this might think that it does. And they might think that the word students perhaps is the main subject here and not the patent literacy symposium. It's also true, maybe you're starting a sentence with the subject, but you have a lot of information in between. So now we started the patent literacy symposium, comma. Now we're going to describe, the author describes that a little more, right? An impressive organization of colleagues. Hmm. Well, that just split the subject from the verb. Organizes is what the symposium is doing here. So that makes it a little difficult for students. We can just help them with this. So what could we do? Sentence manipulation. And many of these ideas, of course, are just organized and um, coded within our um, my handout, just so that it gives you a little summary of what we're talking about here. Yes, and so we have an appositive here, an impressive organization of colleagues that is describing the symposium a little bit more. It is helpful for the reader to understand how these words work in combination with each other. It's describing what just came before. And it also is important to help our students understand the importance of punctuation. These commas are giving you an idea to pause, to think and collect your thoughts before you move on. Letting children know that is really important. And of course, manipulating these sentences here, you could move these around by putting parts of the subject first, you could put it toward the middle, you can move the sections around in here, but showing students how those can be manipulated. Lastly, we'll talk about one of the most difficult, perhaps the most difficult here, is when the subject verb object is not in the order that we expected them. It was the ball that was hit by the bat? Hmm, wait a minute. Well, if you reconstruct that in subject verb order, hmm, the bat hit the ball. Much easier way to say that. So we think about distances between subject verb, the order of subject verb, and how many subjects, how many verbs do we actually have within a sentence as being part of that. We also can conceptualize sentences by sentence type. So we're thinking about this as we ramp up to come back to our, well, our passage about ironing or our passage about barbecues. Now people are guessing over here that maybe that passage, eh, um, I think just people aren't so sure it's about golf anymore. That's the only change maybe that I see here. But we think about that. We have a simple sentence, subject verb is a complete thought. We have a compound sentence, which are, and that's a, that's, those are, that's a dependent, uh, independent, excuse me, clause. We have compound subjects where we have two independent clauses attached or connected by what we call fan boys. Those are those small connective words, right? Our conjunctions, coordinating conjunctions, meaning that two of those parts of the sentences work together in here, and they both are of equal importance for, and, nor, but, or yet so, are examples of our, our coordinating conjunctions within a compound sentence. And of course, lastly, we have complex sentence structures. When we take a look at those, we, we have the complete thought, and then an incomplete thought, a, um, a independent clause and a dependent clause where you have subject verb, subject verb, verb in both of those. However, they are connected by what we call a sub, sub meaning under, subordinating conjunction. And one part of that sentence is not as important as the other. I always, our dear colleague, William Van Cleve, used to, um, has taught me how to conceptualize the important and less important part in a complex sentence structure visually by showing students here. The part of the sentence that begins with your sub, subordinating conjunction um, is less important than the main independent clause. Well, if this is not familiar to you, um, you know there's lots more to know certainly about syntax. This is just a brief overview. Let's now take our sentence work and go to our listening, speaking, reading, writing ideas. Hmm. Read alouds are very important and robust read alouds. Questioning students to speak and asking them to speak in more advanced sentences or complete sentences, and we demonstrating that also washes their world with syntax. Independent reading is important as well, and accurate independent reading. We can't read just 80% of the words as we noticed earlier. And then of course, writing in response to your reading helps improve your sentence structures as we talked about deconstruction, combining, manipulating, so on and so forth. I wanna talk about 
this right here with an example for a read aloud with using the example of the secret garden. So with the secret garden, let me see if I can stop sharing this for just a heartbeat. And sometimes we hear that curricula will decide, okay, if students are really struggling with something, we will just give them an abridged version. So let's think about that for just a heartbeat. If we are trying to wash our children's world with syntax by having them listen to sentences of, of ver you know, various lengths and difficulties, speak, speak them, although speaking complex sentences is not natural, reading them and writing them certainly is something that we want them to be aware of. This is much more academic discourse that we're getting them ready to be familiar with. But when we're reading aloud, let's think about the type of read aloud that we want our children to hear. If we are asking them to work with the secret garden, here I have the abridged version and a classic. So we might tend to say, well, students that actually don't read well, maybe I'm gonna have them read something that's a little bit easier. Let's listen to this and tell me, just listen to this for just a heartbeat and I'll ask you some questions after. Okay, this is Secret Garden, chapter one, no one left. When Mary Lennox was born, no one really wanted her. Her father worked for the government in India and she, he didn't have any time for raising a child. Mary's mother hadn't wanted a little girl at all. She just wanted to go to parties. So their sickly, fretful baby was given to an ayah, an Indian nanny. Mary's ayah knew that the baby's crying made her mother mad. So to keep her quiet, she let her have her own way in everything. Mary grew up very selfish. Her thin face was yellow. Her expression was sour. Even her blonde hair did not behave. Governesses were hired to teach the cross child to read and write. They didn't last longer than a few months. Except for her ayah and the servants, Mary hardly ever saw other people, not even her mother. Hmm. All right. I want you to think about maybe what you visualized. Think about the characters here, the setting. What you can see is maybe a potential plot and problem. Secret Garden. That's the abridged version. Imagine that we only either read that aloud, or if we had students that struggled with decoding, what if they only read abridged versions? Let's compare that now with the classic. Okay. So same section, chapter one, The Secret Garden, there's no one left, and this is the classic version. When Mary Lennox was sent to Misselwaith Manor to live with her uncle, everyone said she was the most disagreeable looking child ever seen. It was true too. She had a thin little face and a thin little body, thin light hair and a sour expression. Her hair was yellow and her face was yellow because she'd been born in India and had always been ill in one way or another. Her father had held a position under the English government and had always been busy and ill himself. And her mother had been a great beauty who cared only to go to parties and amuse herself with people. She had not wanted a little girl at all. And when Mary was born, she handed her over to the care of an ayah, who was made to understand that if she wished to please the Mem Sahib, she must keep that child out of sight as much as possible. So when she was a sickly, fretful, ugly little baby, she was kept out of the way. And when she became a sickly, fretful, toddling thing, she was kept out of the way also. She never remembered seeing familiarly anything but the dark faces of her ayah and the other native servants. And as they had always obeyed her and gave her her own way in everything, because the Mem Sahib will be angry if she disturbed by, was disturbed by her crying. By the time she was six years old, she was as tyrannical and selfish a little pig as ever lived. Whew, that was pretty intensive. The young English governess who came to teach her to read and write disliked her so much that she gave her up in three months. And when other governesses came to try to fill it, they always went away in a shorter time than the first one. So if Mary had not chosen to really want to learn how to read books, she would never have learned her letters at all. Hmm. Well, right. Okay. So think about that for a minute. Which read aloud was a little more enjoyable and informative to you? The abridged version? or the classic version. Go ahead and weigh in in the chat. Okay.
Interesting. All right. Okay. So hands down, except for maybe one, one person or two people here. Um, yeah, you all preferred the classic version right in here. And what you're noting, some of the comments about the classic version are things like, well, the classic version was much more robust. I was able to visualize the characters and the setting and what was happening here. Someone's mentioning there's absolutely no comparison between the two. How incredible to think that a student would just have the abridged version exposure and not be classic right in here, right? So I often think about this when I'm thinking, but well, we're talking about syntax now. The sentence structure was really pretty difficult with some of those sentences. And it there was a lot of words right in there, right? So lots of propositions or idea units, lots of complex sentence structures, lots of um, compound predicates, compound subjects, and very um, widely varied structures in here. But what was really nice, and Lindsay's telling us, there was an immediate connection to the character with lots of detail and description. But we don't have to, um, for our weak decoders, those students don't have to just have the class, the, the um, abridged version. We can be sure we read aloud the classics to wash their world with the syntax that they need to be sensitive to before they go ahead to write and read that for themselves, right? So, yep, some of you are mentioning, and I really appreciate that, you can see the benefits of providing both. Some people talk about text sets and bootstrapping. Marilyn Adams spoke to that exact idea of bootstrapping a certain concept. Imagine if a student read the classic, uh, the abridged, if that's what they could read, could decode, that was followed by a read aloud of the classic. Even though they may not be able to read it themselves at some point, they would be able to understand that a lot deeper. And of course, children that can read and can access that certainly should be exposed to the classic version right off the bat. So we think about that for syntax, right? For sentence structure and sentence sensitivity. Most of you, although not all, preferred the classic version here. Well, there are other things to do beside the read aloud piece. I'll go back to sharing my screen. And as we think about that, of course, we thought about listening. We can read aloud. Speaking will help reinforce that as well. So let me go back to share my second screen. Here we are. So speaking. So it may be, of course, as we think about our ability to be, be able to speak in complete sentences, give directions in increasingly complex sentence structures, and cue children also to be able to speak in a complete sentence. sentence. And of course, one of the ways to help them elaborate that would be by asking them the what, where, when, how, why questions, right? Those WH and the, the how questions so that we can, we have students answer those questions about the key concept that they are trying to talk about. So asking verbally to get students to speak in more complete sentences and elaborate on their thoughts in one complete sentence gives them that sense and set, sentence of sensitivity to be able to understand it at the reading level eventually. When we think about that, of course, reading and writing is where we're talking about. We're talking about reading complex text and writing in response to those, of course, sentence imitation that we dabbled with just a moment is important. And we would want to gradually increase the complexity of what we're working with, with sentence types. So this is one of my favorite. This is in your handouts. If you ever want to take a, um, a moment to play with this, this is, of course, Dostoevsky's work um, here from Crime and Punishment, one of my favorite novels in high school. And that was really because I had a fabulous teacher um, that helped me unpack all of that literature at very high levels. So thinking about this here, if I were looking, I could work in increasingly more complex levels here. And I think about this right in, right in here, I might ask my students to start where I think they are sensitive to sentence imitation and then increase what I'm asking them to imitate here. So these are four sentences completely pulled out of crime and punishment. You would want them to imitate the exact structure. His head ate, head ate, subject, predicate, pretty much it, right? In a very simple sentence in here. So if you were to imitate that sentence, that would be fairly easy. Imagine the second sentence. Let's take a moment to read that. He crept on tiptoe to the door, stealthily opened it, 
and begin listening on the staircase. What's going on in that sentence that might be a little difficult? How many subjects? And you can chat this in if you want, or just be reflective of that. He, right, that's one. And we'd also, by the way, have to know who he refers to. Well, what did he do? Yep, one subject. How many actions is that he doing? He crept, opened, and yeah, I see it. Yep, many of you, thank you, Shelly, three, and listened. So this subject now is doing three different things, right? So that's the compound predicate. We think about that being slightly more difficult. If you want a student to replicate that, sim that type of sentence, that would help them become much more aware of what it is you're asking children to do. So it's a very strong way in which to, to work, sentence replication or imitation. If we had his hand shook as he sewed, comma, but he did it successfully so that nothing showed outside. Hmm. I see a comma, and then I see that coordinating conjunction, but. That was one of the fanboys, wasn't it? His hands shook as he sewed. That's an independent clause, stands by itself. It's a sentence. He did it successfully so that nothing showed outside. That also can stand by itself, both equal in their importance. That's a compound sentence. So it makes that one a little trickier, right? So to, to have students be able to replicate something at a compound sentence level is helpful. And as you can bet, I'm sure at this point, what type of sentence is that very last one? Complex, thank you. Yep, thank you, Elise. And we think of complex, when he finished with this, that's a dependent clause, it can't stand by itself. It does have a subject, a who or a what, but it does have a do, he finished. But when he finished this, what is the main subject in that sentence? It is the he, isn't it? When he finished this, he, and what is the main verb? Thrust, thrust what? His hand, where? into a little opening between his sofa and the floor. So the author is answering, answering the who or what, the do in here, what it is that he's thrusting, and then where into a little opening. The when he finished with this is a little harder. It makes that sentence a little more difficult because you have to wait for really understanding what that main subject is in that sentence. So getting students to imitate sentences like that and understand the who or what and the major do as well as working and moving things around is very helpful. Well, I find this interesting because truly when comprehension problems become really obvious is not in kindergarten or first grade or sometimes even second. It's around the time that we ask children to read challenging text. So when we ask our children to read closely, we don't want to wait until third or fourth grade to start thinking about that instruction. We can get our children to wash their world by listening to complex sentence structure and more difficult sentences, speak, speak some of them, read, of course, eventually when the decoding gets um, to a point where they're able to read those more independently and accurately, and of course, write them. You know, it's been a little while since we've talked about that golf passage, right, which some of us now think is no longer about golf. Fair enough. So let's think about this. Hmm. Did the sim sentence structure make this difficult at all? I know we talked about curring. Remember what that's about? I want to type that in the chat. Do you remember what curring is? A curring is. And there's something about a. Uh, there you go. Yep, horse judging and inspecting horses. There you go. It's related to horses. Evaluating some breeds. There you go. Okay, get, great. Now, as some people are saying, it's evaluating Danish horses. Interesting, right? This is about Dutch horses. So that's the right first sound. Um, these are Dutch. So let's pull apart the sentence structure in here to see what that might have done to us. The first sentence is fairly lengthy right in here. It looks like four or five lines. Now you can know, yep, you're right. The length of that sentence gives us, gives us difficulty. Not only the length, but well, the main subject, members, doesn't happen right away, right? Yep, multiple propositions. There you go, Elise, blah, 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 blah. And then boom, there comes members. So members is not front up, center, it's a little harder to hold on to some of that information in our working memory. So given the upcoming controversial occurring season, comma, three jury members. Now, what did those jury members do? Yes, 
Thank you, Lindsay. They do three different things. Yikes is right. Briefed, packed, caught. Or caught up on. So they did three different things. That's a compound predicate. So we can predict that right there, that first sentence, which goes on for quite a bit. It's a great sentence, tells us a lot. Kids are gonna need to unpack that to understand it. Now we go to our next sentence. Where's our main, oh my gosh, we don't have one subject here, do we? We have three compound subject, Bart, Lana, and Gerard. Those are three people we're talking about. What did they do? They bantered, they did one thing. Although if students don't know what bantered means, that's a little tricky. So now we have the first sentence where we have to wait for a while for the main subject and we have compound predicate. The second sentence, a compound subject. This is not as easy as we once thought. They were exhausted. That's a pretty straightforward piece, right? Yep. Yes, Lindsay, a simple sentence finally, they were exhausted. Although in just a moment, you're gonna see that's not as simple as we really think. Their concern, the concern, is the subject of the next sentence here and you have to wait for a while for it. Concern, now we have was overshadowed, yep. Yeah, and someone's asking me this question. Wait a minute, you're a little confused. Why is the curring season controversial? Hmm, did the author tell you that? The author didn't tell us that yet, right? Okay, well, we'll think about that. Maybe we'll find out as we finish our time together. So <laughs> the concern was overshadowed. And then of course, now we have that last sentence, it was worth, it was worth every second of the worries they carried. Well, wait a minute, what is it referring to? Well, hang on just a heartbeat. That makes that one even a little bit more difficult here. Yeah, okay. Well, when we think about simple compound and complex sentence structures or reasons for syntax being difficult here, we wanna keep these ideas in mind. Take them out, we can deconstruct, we can, imitate, we can really analyze and become sensitive syntactically to better understand what's happening within a sentence. Yeah, yep, and many of you were having some questions about this, like why are people worried? Why was it controversial? What's going on? A little confused, so rightfully so. Here we go, this will help us. Our next layer is what we've missed. I'll wear this layer now. We talked about language structure, say that with me language structures. Now we're moving on to the next strand in the rote model, verbal reasoning. Say that with me, verbal reasoning. We're going to talk about local cohesion. We're going to talk about the idea of whether or not the sentences, the author has been cohesive with the sentences and the idea units that are provided within this passage here. We're going to talk about the, in, the need to always infer or read between the lines. And do you know what? You cannot infer if you don't have background knowledge with which to think, right? So when you think about that problem, we're gonna come back. We were already stumped with, by one simple word with vocabulary, we're gonna be stumped. Like how many of you out there understand the world of currings and Dutch warm bloods? Probably just me, right? Or people who know me. And then metacognition, our thinking about our thinking as we read, as we listen, um, of course, um, as we go through. That's a very important part of our idea with verbal reasoning. So let's go back and see how this passage may send us in an interesting direction if we truly don't understand what some of the cohesive, the local cohesiveness um, is sharing with us. So we look at this first sentence and I wanna ask us about this word, themselves, which is a pronoun, a plural pronoun, who, does themselves refer to in that sentence? Can you type that in the chat? Hmm. Okay, great. I think most, this is pretty clear. Yep, most of us have that. And now we know that that word is jury. So that makes sense. Yep, As some of us are saying that themselves are Bart, Lana and Harard. The author hasn't told us that quite yet, right? So, so far, all we know is themselves is referring to some unnamed as you know such so far three jury members so three jury members briefed themselves hmm. okay that's not so bad because it's in the same sentence so they briefed themselves on the regulations packed the official iron and caught up on their sleep whose sleep again is this go ahead and chat that in well, this one's pretty easy, right? Yep, the jury. Yep, April, thank you. Yep, the jury, again, because we really haven't introduced anybody else yet. 
So that makes it a little bit easier, but showing students how this works together, how this glues together helps us as well with our understanding. Well, we go down a little further. We have another plural pronoun, another they. Hmm. So once they are born and comfortably seated, Bart, Lana, and Harard bantered with the stewards as they made their way toward Boston. Wait a minute, I have a question here. Who is that they? You wanna check that? Do you, we still think it's Bart, Lana, and Harard? Does anybody think it's also the stewards? Are they all going? Well, are just Bart, Lana, and Harard going to Boston? The stewards are also, is it just the stewards? Oh, yep, there you go. Danielle's saying, yeah, all of them, because they're all flying. You know, the stewards didn't get off the plane, I don't think, I hope not. So Bart, Lana, and Harard, and also, it has to be the stewards, right? They're all bantering back and forth. And it's obvious here, some of you are telling us, the plane is going to Boston. Now, because we know the definition of the word curring, where's the plane originating, originating from? It's going to Boston. Where's it, where did it start? Yeah, there you go, Holland. Yeah, many of you are suggesting that. So here's a plane with three jury members, the stewards, so probably the Netherlands and Holland, probably, not necessarily, but probably, and they're coming over. Okay, here's another they. They made their way, right? Probably Bart, Lana, and Harard, and, and of course, probably the stewards too. Well, the next sentence is simple, but it's they. Hmm. Oh, this is a great question. Wait a minute. Someone's wondering this, and thank you for that. Do you think those stewards are caretakers of those horses? Hmm. Maybe. Did the author tell us? Well, the author hasn't told us that yet, but there's a maybe. Okay. Let's keep that in our working memory, right? Okay. This time, someone is telling me that they think only Bartlana and Harard are exhausted. Why do we think that? They were exhausted. Hmm. Yeah, stewards is an old fashioned word for a flight attendant, attendant. So maybe the stewards aren't the horse caretakers, they're the, the flight attendants. Maybe the people that are exhausted, this is the guess that guessing that we're seeing in the chat are just the three, right? Who we think now are the jury members, right? Bart, Lana, and Harard. Hmm. They were tired, exhausted. Yeah, there's a time change, so that's another. And aren't all adults exhausted? I love that comment. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah, hmm, okay, well, and they have to catch up on their sleep. That's true, okay. So we'll continue on. So we think that's Bart, Lana, and Harad being exhausted, but we're not sure the stewards could be exhausted, right? The author doesn't really tell us. Now, hmm, reminded of past security breaches. Hmm, somebody's still wanting to know about this darn iron, they said. Yeah, their concern for the safe transport of the iron, and there's another there there, was overshadowed only by their fond memories of backyard cookouts. That's what somebody thought this was all about, right? A backyard competition for barbecues, meeting new friends and hosting award ceremonies. Hmm, their fond memories. Well, whose memories? Do you think it's the jury? Do you think it's the stewards? Do you think it's all of them? This time, I think, I think you're right. It's the jury, yep. So it all goes back to Bart, Lana and Harard. So that's really the glue of many of these pronouns especially the, you know, the plural pronouns, but it's a little tricky because the stewards get introduced there and the author begins start, starting to talk about some of those as well. It was worth every second of the worries they carried. Remember, we're talking about it being pretty, that last sentence being a little bit easier, but what is it, right? Hmm. Okay, what is it referring to? Not really sure. It was worth every second of the words they carried. Hmm. The whole experience, some people are guessing. Their concerns. The concerns were worth every second of the words they carried. The experience occurring. These are some of the guesses that some of us are saying in the chat. Nice. Okay. All right. So we're not really sure, but we're thinking maybe it's the experience. Maybe it's the occurring. Maybe it's the flight. Maybe it's their worries. Okay. Maybe it's the competition. Okay. Well, there's a lot now that we still don't know, but that's, that has to do with cohesiveness, right? When we think about that, that concern right in here. So when we think about how ideas tie together within a passage here, you really do have to know something to learn something. We have to know something behind 
um, what it is that we're reading in order to understand what we're reading at close levels. I'd like to do in as our uh, few minutes, last few minutes together before we um, entertain any questions or comments here, I'm going to pull over a Jamboard that I created. And just based on the numbers of people here, I would love for us to be able to do the Jamboard. I'm going to just run this myself um, with you so that we can we can walk through the thought process here. This is a passage that came from a text. And I'll tell you nothing much more than that. Right in here, there are three, four, five, six, seven sentences in this passage here. Okay. So we'll keep the curring, you know, that curring in mind to the side for just a heartbeat. We'll look at this here as something that students might be able to do to help them understand how we glue ideas together within a sentence. We're going to take these sentences and reconstruct the paragraph that the author likely meant. With that in mind, when we think about this here, we can read, hopefully you can read this large so we can see some of these sentences here. If you're ready, in the chat, when we organize these, I'd like somebody to chat in, which sentence do you believe should be the first sentence in this passage? And most importantly, I want you to tell me why. Yep, three people have already told me now, it is once upon a time. Could somebody type in why? And I'll move that over. So once upon a time, once upon a time, she began, I had a beautiful cousin who managed to build her web across a small stream. That's how fairy tales begin. So now we know this last strand in Hollis Scarborough's rope, right? Text structure is helping us. That's in our working memory right in here. That is how we open a story. Perfect. Good. Someone else made this little prediction here. We're predicting that the story is about a spider. I wonder what gave you that idea. Well, she built her web. So there's the spider. What sentence likely would come second? Okay. We have some conflicting thoughts or different thoughts, so it's all good. So we have the she swooped down and threw great masses of wrapping material around the fish and fought bravely to capture it. Two or three of you voted for that. Now, and the reasoning was, and I want you always to add in the reasoning why, the reasoning was that it starts to get some into some action in here. Oh, there's another thought here, another, okay. The reason for this one is it kind of introduces a fish, a second character within this passage. Some of you are suggesting that perhaps prior to that, you'll notice that one day, a tiny fish leaped into the air and got tangled in the web. Hmm. I think you're wanting that one because you need the setting. Hmm. Let's try that. Do you like that one better? It makes better sense to you. And we want to think why, why does that make better sense to you? Hmm. One, once upon a time, she began, I had a beautiful cousin who managed to build her web across a small stream. One day, a tiny fish leaped into the air and got tangled in the web. Oh, some of you are telling us that that starts some of the, well, there's something that's happening that's going to be a problem. You've introduced a second character and there's a problem coming up. After one day, a tiny fish leaped into the air. What do you want next? My cousin, thank you, Nancy, was very much surprised, of course, and what Nancy is suggesting is the reason that sentence might be third is it's, the, it's showing the spider's reaction to the fish, what the fish did, the fish's action, and here's a reaction. Makes sense, I think. My cousin was very much surprised, of course. Okay, so if that's true, what might be next? The fish was thrashing wildly. Okay, let's try that. And why would we think maybe the fish, it tells her reaction to, oh, okay. It's, we're talking about actions and reactions in the chat here now. Okay, so once upon a time, one day a tiny fish leaped. My cousin was surprised. The fish was thrashing wildly. Something has to happen about that. Hmm, yep, action, reaction, action, reaction. 
Oh, the fish was thrashing wildly. So now we need an action. She swooped down and threw, well, my cousin hardly dared tackle it is what some of you are saying. Okay. And that's because it's reacting to the fish. It was so wild that the, the spider was a little bit nervous about tackling it, but she did. That's what some of you are telling me you would like next, because that's again, sentence, sentence, reaction, reaction. And then of course we finish that up with, she swooped down and threw great masses of wrapping material, material around the fish and fought bravely to capture it. Ties it all up, doesn't it? Yep, nice job. That's the resolution. That's right, thank you. Okay, great. So, and some people, when we have this kind of an idea, the most important part of taking sentences and sentence strips, cutting them up and moving them around and talking about that is the why. Why do you think this belongs here? Why would you put this here? Um, so we think about and get much more comfortable with sense, sentence sense, with cohesiveness, especially local cohesion, and our understanding of how the author is trying to give us the main ideas within this passage. So that whole passage, well done, would look like something like this, right? We started out once upon a time. One day, here's the action. My cousin was very much surprised, a reaction. The fish react, the cousin react to, to that, was a little scared, but she did. And then this is the resolution, right? Which is neat. Yep, so, and you are right. This is a very simple preparation to help students understand that syntactic sensitivity in here. So as we finish this up, this idea up here, we would have come back around to the idea that our goals today were to think about literacy knowledge and verbal reasoning to predict what makes text difficult and why, experience a few interactions and activities in order to support those reasons and really become smarter than our programs. So we've talked about that both at the sentence level and at the connected text level. By the way, thinking about background knowledge, one of you just guessed, thank you, April, that that passage was directly out of Charlotte's Web. That's right. Okay, now what makes comprehension difficult? We have to finish this, don't we, before we finish our, our time together and get to a few maybe questions and answers and, and comments here. Hmm. What is this really about? Do you have all your questions answered about what makes this so difficult? Remember, it was not about coffee, right? Oh, somebody's wanting to know what the official iron is. Hmm, okay. And you need to know, thank you, Lizzie. Yep, you need to know the controversy. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little, and security breaches, that's right. And the horseshoe, I know something about a horseshoe. Here we go. It's not about the coffee, right, as we know, it's about currings. Let me give you a little background knowledge here, okay? So right in here, when we, we um, yeah, yep, I'm talking about why the jury freaked out, that's right. <laughs> so SSF is the name of our farm, Shooting Star Farm. For those of you who know me, and actually a couple of people have mentioned, if you are friends with my husband on Facebook, you would likely know this. Um, interestingly enough. So we raised Dutch warm bloods. We have them in our backyard. These are pictures of some of them. My daughter, Michaela, myself, and some of the, the jury members um, coming over to inspect them. When they come over, of course, they take the official branding iron. There it is right there with my friend, Cynthia. She's about to brand me um, at this curring in here. So, so um, what happened, the controversy, of course, would have been in the paragraph preceding what it is that we just talked about, the idea that the prior year, Bart, who is the head jury member, which the author did not tell you, of course, um, brought the iron over. And because he was so concerned about it being lost or compromised because it was the only one, he brought it on board. Can you imagine bringing that on board the airplane? You can, you can man, you imagine he got stopped, pulled over and questioned and pretty much missed a curring or two because he, there was a great controversy. He was almost locked up. Um, he would not give that away. So that was the controversy. And if we go back to this passage right in here, you will see the upcoming controversial curring season. Well, what was happening? They were really afraid of losing that iron in here. And we had COVID protocols for the prior years. So they briefed themselves on the adjusted regulations for the jury. They packed that iron in the, in the carry-on, not in the carry-on compartment, in the check-in. 
and they got ready, flew over, of course, and they were, let's see, remember that we're reminded of past security breaches, that problem with the iron, their concern for the safe transport of the branding iron was only overshadowed by their fond memories of backyard cookouts, because we always have a cookout at the end of occurring, meeting people, hosting awards. And they were all very worthy um, things to do. So that's the reason, reason behind the background knowledge. Yep, and it, yes, the it, thank you, Patty, that they were worried about was transporting the iron and getting it there safely. Nice, okay. Um, okay, so, so there are some great questions in here. We were untangling two strands of the reading rope, our language structures and verbal reasoning. I wanna thank you very much, but before we stop that, I might wanna just check in and see if there are any questions that we should be entertaining during our time. <laughs> 